Welcome to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum's Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I'm the Manager of Public Programs and Outreach here at the museum. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome back to those of you who have joined us for many, many programs before. This virtual series features programs on Pennsylvania transit history topics and stories about the trolley era that you can experience from home, usually on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And we're gonna continue these as long as we have presenters. So if you have a program that fits our museum mission, please let me know. That would be anything about Pennsylvania, the trolley era, cities where our streetcars come from. Um, and if you have something that doesn't quite fit those guidelines, please reach out anyway. And you can see the full list of upcoming presentations on our website, patrolley.org, which I will share in the chat box in just a few minutes. Um, and I wanna extend a very special thank you to those of you who donated tonight when registering for the program. Uh, and those of you who have made donations all year, uh, either through the registration or on our website, we really, really appreciate your support of our virtual programs. And for the new folks who are joining us tonight, we were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. And we opened a few years later in 1963 and we're actually located along the former interurban route between Pittsburgh and Washington, PA. You'll find, I think over 50 now trolleys and electric railway cars at the museum, about 20 of which operate and over 30,000 visitors per year take the four mile scenic ride here at the museum. And just a few updates before we get started. On the left hand side there, you can see the glass going in on our um, new Welcome and Education Center. This is along Volunteer Boulevard. You can see the brick paved street in the foreground there with the rail. Um, that's coming along. We are hoping uh, we're gonna open later this year in the fall. And on the right side, one of our projects that we've been working on for a long time is uh, PCC 1138, a pre-war pre um, air electric PCC. And that has gone through a few test runs already. And uh, hopefully that will be out soon. So um, congratulations to everybody who's been working on that. They're still tweaking it, but it'll hopefully be entering service sometime this year. Um, and last week, we had a wonderful visit from a group from the UK and the Isle of Man. Uh, I just wanted to shout out anybody who, who is out there <laughs> watching tonight or afterwards on YouTube. We had a great visit from some rail enthusiasts overseas. So um, if we have any overseas viewers tonight or viewers from around the country, if you're in one of these kinds of clubs or groups, um, let us know. We'll be happy to accommodate your tour at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. And lastly, work is progressing on the terrible trolley, which you can see there uh, being delivered to the museum back in on May 31st on the right. And it's a paint scheme. We're working to um, basically cosmetically and operationally restore this trolley. On the left-hand side, um, a gentleman we did an oral history with last weekend um, named Chester. He worked in the sign shop and the uh, paint shop at Port Authority back in the 70s and 80s and worked on some of Pittsburgh's most famous painted cars like the Clark Bar car and the terrible trolley and others. So um, we got to interview him. So he's sitting there with his son and two, uh, our two project managers for the terrible trolley, Jack in the orange shirt and Aiden in the green shirt. So uh, we are very excited to get to interview him. Stay tuned for uh, more updates on the terrible trolley as we work on that. Okay, and now I would like to introduce tonight's presenter, Craig Thorpe. Artist J. Craig Thorpe grew up with the sense that rail systems were necessary for society's common good. Born and raised in Pittsburgh, PA, his grandfather regularly took him for rides on streetcars and commuter trains. By the 1960s, he witnessed the negative effects on community and regional vitality as passenger rail systems were abandoned in the name of progress. During his bachelor's program in design at Carnegie Mellon University, Thorpe began to ponder the opportunities to bring his skills, interests, and training together. After brief service in the Army, he worked for architects in Virginia, honing his illustration skills. Following a master's program near Boston, Thorpe relocated to Seattle and eventually specialized in architectural renderings. 
a commission to show the proposed train station for Olympia, Washington, opened the door to national exposure when Amtrak requested use of the art in its 1993 national calendar. Since that time, rail subjects have formed a major part of Thorpe's portfolio. While some of his art is commissioned by private collectors, the bulk of his work originates with corporate clients. In addition to Amtrak, his works have been used by the White Pass and Yukon Route, Union Tank Car Company, GE Transportation Systems, the Grand Canyon Railway, and countless commuter transit excursion and museum operations, including the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. Okay, and at the end of this presentation, we will have a question and answer session with the presenter. So uh, the chat box will be open throughout. So if you have any questions or comments during the show, um, go ahead and type those in there. We'll get through those at the end. And a reminder, this program is being recorded and shared within the next few weeks on our YouTube channel. So let's keep our microphones muted. I'll ask you to turn off your videos now and uh, we'll, I'll invite you to turn those on again at the end. Okay, Craig, if you are ready, take it away. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to click some buttons here and see what we can get doing. Continue. And Craig will be leaving his video on tonight. So um, just, you know, you guys know how to use Zoom by this point. So if, if you don't, send me a private message in the chat and I can let you know how to hide the video if you want to. There we go. I think we're set. Yes. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. And Good afternoon for those of you on the West Coast, or perhaps midway. Uh, it's a treat to be here. And I wanted to thank Kristen before I get into the show here. Uh, I had the opportunity to be at uh, Pennsylvania Trauma Museum on a book signing tour back in April and May. And I really enjoyed that. So Kristen, I want to thank you and Scott and Larry and others who made that visit so special for me and enabled me to be a part of uh, sort of witnessing the, the energy of the place. Uh, it was that weekend that a volunteer boulevard was named and there were other special things that were done and said and given. And it was, uh, it was a real thrill to be a part of the, uh, of the energy that is the Pennsylvania Trauma Museum. So many thanks. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing tonight is looking at parts of my new book, Railroads, Art, and American Life, an Artist's Memoir. This is a recent publication of Indiana University Press. And it puts together themes that, well, most people don't ordinarily think about putting together. Railroads and American life and art right between them that speaks in both directions and art in its own way, railroad art in its own way, kind of ties some of this stuff together. So what I'll be doing tonight is sharing ideas that you wouldn't ordinarily expect to fit. Uh, and uh, that's where we're gonna go. The book lays out with several chapters of uh, autobiographical material uh, as will this presentation. And then, uh, uh, the, the book goes into three chapters that consider how my art has been used in the, in the, with a historical focus, a present focus, and a future, which I call past, present, and possible. So I'll be looking at that, but more, more from the electric railroad and streetcar perspective than, than the, the way the book itself is laid out. This is more, the book is more inclusive, has a lot of different railroad themes. But for our purposes tonight, I'm gonna uh, really focus on the electric railway and streetcar and interurban world. So that's where we're gonna go over the next hour or 45 minutes or whatever it will be. So I want to start by uh, asking uh, this question. Uh, I, I wonder how many of you have ever said this to yourself or you've ever heard other people say, there's just something about a train or a trolley. You know, it might be historic or vintage rail equipment, it might be contemporary, it might be photographs or paintings of what could be, uh, it might be electric railway, uh, horse cars, could be trains, steam engines, diesels, electrics, whatever and however you slice and dice this thing of, of trains and trolleys, this this sentence, this, this 
theme kind of comes up. Well, there's just something about a train or a trolley. Sometimes when I ask the question, all the hands go up in the room. Of, of course, people say, we all ask that. That's why we're here. We have something in common with this something about a train or a trolley. So my thesis is that railroad art invites us into that something. Uh, perhaps it does it in a way that even photographs, as, as cool as they are, don't do. They, this, th this realm of railway art invites us into that something and shows us that trains and trolleys are far more than just another way to move ourselves and our stuff. So that's, that's kind of uh, how, we're, how we're moving along here. And why does this not want to advance? There we go. This is me at about age seven in Pittsburgh. Actually, the photograph is taken in Connellsville, Pennsylvania on a Baltimore and Ohio fall foliage excursion. Uh, my folks took me and, uh, and my grandfather on a number of these train trips. And that was where all this got started for me. Also, I had quite an interest in art as a, as a youngster. And at Christmas time, I started squirreling away a stash of uh, Christmas cards. Most of those were of the old uh, Courier and Ives historical nostalgic kind of paintings, you know, snowy train scenes and steam engines. And I loved those things. So that was, that was my beginning to putting trains and art together. Uh, when I've used, put this slide up, uh, just just about every time somebody is, is bound to ask what flavor was the ice cream cone well i assume it was vanilla i wish it had been strawberry but uh, i digress moving right ahead it wasn't just the courier and ives artwork that got me going it was the artwork of griff teller now some of you folks out there tonight may know the name of griff teller he was an artist, he lived and worked in New Jersey. He's most famous for his 27 calendar paintings for the Pennsylvania Railroad, which he did over the course of the years from the late 20s to uh, the early 60s. Well, our family had some friends who worked for the Pensy, and about the time I was seven years old or thereabouts, they started giving us desktop calendars and I was thrilled. So here we are. This is the 1954 painting, Pittsburgh Promotes Progress. And it shows the golden triangle with this warm glow, the evening sun coming across uh, the West End. Uh, we see the Ohio River off to the left, the uh, Allegheny River right uh, under one of those bridges and the Monongahela to the right. And trains and trolleys and towboats were just a part of the scene. Transportation made the city. And for me, it was the trains and trolleys that really caught my attention. I, uh, I started collecting these and, uh, and was, was qu quite motivated to somehow make railroad art a part of my story. Well, it wasn't just the artwork. I had a chance to ride those trains and trolleys, thanks to my grandfather who lived with us. And as we did this, I began to get a sense that it was almost like we had a, a network. You know, I'm going to put my hands up here and interweave my fingers like a net or, or, or as such. And I felt that the, the network of rail around Pittsburgh tied our city together, whether it was streetcars or commuter trains like we see here on the right, or perhaps uh, intercity passenger trains, uh, excursion trains, somehow that rail system tied us together. And it, 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 it lent a sense of security and, and connectedness. So it was though you took this, like a, almost a, a net or a fishnet kind of thing and put it over the hills and the valleys and the haulers as we called them. Uh, and, and that was the ethos that I, uh, I grew up with. But it was still the Griff Teller paintings that I continued to go back to. What was that something about trains? And of course, by trolleys as well. But what was that something about trains that was reflected 
in Griff Teller's visionary art. Now, I had no idea at that time about just how much railroad art was a part of American industrial heritage. I learned later a couple of facts. I'm going to share two of them with you right now. This is the 1956 painting by Griff Teller, Dynamic Progress, and it shows forward-looking trains, freight trains on the right, passenger train on the left uh, in, in uh, central Pennsylvania. I had no idea that railroads, other than the Pensy, did calendars. But boy, they did. And the Pensy really did it. You know how many they did each year? 300,000 wall calendars. If you do the math, I'm told, uh, 300,000 railroad calendars takes up about 15 boxcars. So that's a whole freight train just of wall calendars. That's not to say anything about the small calendars and other ways that this was printed. And also, you know, railroads have, have traditionally used timetables. Uh, Amtrak doesn't do printed timetables now, but the, their timetables are, are a major part of American railroad history. Well, all of those timetables, or most of them, had some kind of a drawing or painting on them. And to go back to the Pensig, they did things in a big way. Most railroads would put out a new calendar twice a year, whenever the time changed, you know, not the Pensy. They would do it every month. The math comes out to 100,000 calendars a month, or 100,000 new timetables every month. And as I said a minute ago, all of those, virtually all of them, had artwork on it. And those are just two examples of how much Railroad art was a part of our national scene. It was so important and we took it for granted, but it told a story and it was a story of invitation. Anyway, I wanted to paint like Griff. Well, I started, this is a 1960 or 1961 pen and ink with watercolor wash uh, a drawing that I did in high school. Those of you who don't know Pittsburgh wouldn't recognize that crazy domed building in the middle. That was the Civic Auditorium or the Civic Arena. Big deal in, in uh, urban renewal Pittsburgh. The Gulf Building is the one in the background that had that orange uh, glow on the, on the top that would they, they change the, the colors to, as part of the weather forecasting. <laughs> but at any rate, this drawing with watercolor wash shows two streetcars on a rebuilt Center Avenue that was going past the, the then brand new Civic Auditorium. And if anybody's really looking at that, that, uh, that streetcar closely, you'll see that the number on it is 1713. That's the terrible trolley. So I was drawing that car way back then. So I, I, uh, I tried to share with some of my high school friends the fact that I, I saw streetcars and trains as, as vital to our city, you know, that whole network kind of idea. Well, I got laughed out of town. Nobody was, was, was interested in that. They just wanted to talk about sports and cars and sports and girls and sports. So I sort of really did my own thing. But by the early 1960s, you know, this something that I'm referring to, whatever, however we describe that, that something was lost. And it was lost in the public mind when all trains were summarily labeled as nostalgic. Yes, they're quaint, that's nice, but they're irrelevant. Trains and trolleys are irrelevant. We're into progress now. This is, all these other things are as irrelevant as a steam engine. So this is a, a, a drawing that I did in, uh, in high school. And it uh, is of the East Broadtop, which was, and now is, a, uh, is being restored, a wonderful example of America's industrial railroad heritage in central Pennsylvania. And I liked that, I still do. And I liked history, I liked steam engines, but I kept going back to what I wrote on the left side of the screen here. Whatever that something was about trains was lost. And it was lost when everybody started calling trains simply nostalgic. What is that? I continue to ask that question. Well, I had an opportunity 
the summer after graduation from high school and then two successive summers to work at Carnegie Mellon University. This was going to be my college where I was going to start in the fall of 1966 in the industrial design program. And I had a chance to work with Transportation Research Institute. That was a HUD funded, that's housing and urban development, a HUD funded think tank on the campus. And our focus was to look at new concepts for urban transportation. Well, the hot item was what was known as Skybus. This was a rubber tired computer controlled uh, system that was designed, electric system that was designed by Westinghouse. So the company built a test loop or a test track at one of the regional fairgrounds, and they enlisted us at Transportation Research Institute to, uh, to help promote this and do research about its, uh, its applicability and, and, and such for different urban settings. So I was the gopher dude, the young guy, uh, and I was also, as an artist, called on to do renderings, being one of them. Now, there was a series of about six illustrations I did early that summer. And I have to be honest with you, I kind of had mixed feelings. I liked the idea of new transportation concepts, but the impersonal nature of Skybus did not impress me at all. Heavens, I could go ride the trains and the trolleys, and I could talk to the operators, and I could talk to the conductors. And there was there was a a sense of community as well as a sense of service and connection. Well, I swallowed my, uh, my feelings there and, and, and dove into this project. But I wanna share two quick stories. One, uh, I was working, I was going home after, actually after a day working at TRI and I had a whole series of these sky bus drawings under my arm. And I was crossing Forbes Street in Pittsburgh uh, on Smithfield and right in front of a stopped streetcar, my foot caught in the trolley track and I started stumbling forward. And all the pencils that I had jammed into my pocket and I think some of the drawings suddenly took flight and rained down on the cobblestones there on, on Forbes Avenue. I was so embarrassed. I just wanted to turn tail and get out of Dodge as fast as I could. And as I was turning, I, my eye caught the eye of the operator on the streetcar in a big grin on his face. And he, with, with a kind of an easy motion of his hand, he basically said, take as much time as you want to collect the tools of your trade. So I did. And I picked up the pencils and I got all that artwork back and in, in, in my portfolio. And, uh, and then as I recovered my demeanor, I began to think, what just happened here? I had a connection with a person who was operating this streetcar. And there was a, this, this personal sense, uh, a very human experience. And I thought, once again, this ain't gonna happen with Skybus. Well, I just tucked that message away. And, and, and build on it later. At the end of the summer, all of the drawings came back to me and to us at TRI except one. I had no idea where it was and I still don't know, but I began, began to suspect that maybe one of the supervisors said, you know, five finger discount, this poor loin that thing. I, uh, I talked about this with some other folks and we thought, yeah, yeah, maybe somebody thought that uh, uh, that the, the drawing was good enough to say that Thorpe has a, a place at the transportation table in a few years. And that got me started. I took that as a sign that yes, there would be a place. To, and that was the beginning of everything that you're seeing here today. Well, June the 5th, or sorry, May the 5th, 1970, was the end of commuter train service to McKeesport. Uh, that was where I had gone with my grandfather to ride the commuter trains and watch the Capital Limited B&O's flagship train. And thousands of people stormed downtown McKeesport to celebrate the end of rail service to that part of town. And they actually tore up parts of the rail crossings and tore up parts of this signal tower across the street from it. 
uh, there was a new station built, but it was five blocks away or something like that. Uh, none of us had a sense that commuter service was going to last, and it didn't. Uh, but that day, I was feeling very forlorn and, uh, and, and very dark because uh, I saw the end of this all in the name of progress. But was it? Was it really progress? Also, I was graduating from Carnegie Mellon. That was a good deal. But it looked like I was headed for Vietnam as a second lieutenant in the Transportation Corps. Mercifully, that did not happen. And uh, I uh, moved into some other directions, which I'm going to mention. But this idea of what was that something about trains that was missed in the name of progress continued to, to uh, foment in me. Well, I graduated, was in the Army, got out early. That's another story for some other time. Uh, Moved to Virginia, then moved to New England, went to graduate school, uh, got a job in Seattle, came out here, was involved with architectural illustration, and got married, had some kids. And as all of that dramatic turnover for that decade was moving along, I kind of pushed the railroad themes and this something about trains down below the surface. But then, my mother-in-law presented me with a box of oil paints and canvases and brushes and said to me, you need to paint. And I kind of balked at that for a bit, but then I thought, you know, I think she's right. This is something that's in me that needs to be developed. So I did several paintings, landscapes, but the first rail landscape was this of the Southern Pacific 44, 49 daylight along the uh, Washington coast here near Seattle. Well, as my then architectural business started to develop, I reached out to different clients and it ended up that I had a chance to talk with the project manager who was in charge of the new station at Olympia, Washington. That time, uh, the Seattle area, or actually Olympia, just had a uh, like a waiting shelter where it was known as the local Amshack. And they wanted to design and construct a building that was fitting for the state capitol. So I got involved and the client paid me to do this painting. Well, Amtrak saw it and they said, can we use this painting? Can we give you a, a stipend and, and use it on our national corporate calendar? So that indeed happened. And here is a a uh, black and white photo of uh, Graham Clater on the right, who was then the president of Amtrak, and on the left, Congressman Al Swift from uh, Bellingham, Washington, looking at one of the posters that was used to promote the new station project. Uh, they, they made about, I guess, about eight, $8,000 or $8,500 in poster sales, but they made about six or $360,000 in uh, uh, material and labor that was donated because of that painting. So it really, it really took off and it, it confirmed for me the role that art, railroad art can have. Well, that was quickly followed by this piece, the X2000. Some of you may remember when the X2000 uh, Swedish train toured the United States, it's 1993, May to July. The train came from, was actually a design of a say of Brown Bovary in Europe, and was one of a series of these Swedish trains uh, running all over that country. Well, this one set was used in the Northeast Corridor um, from Washington the North, and then went on a national tour and then came back and, and was used again in the Northeast Corridor to finish off that year. So uh, I had the opportunity to do this painting that was a major part of that promotion. And it's set in, uh, in work or in motion, uh, a whole series of paintings like this. It seems like the, during, the, during the, the early 1990s, uh, there were about six different European train companies that had their, uh, their, their trains here in the US. And they were trying to get uh, Amtrak and others to, uh, to sign on and buy off the shelf equipment. What didn't happen that easily is, most of you know, but the X2000 was a major force that led to the Acela. 
And uh, so I had the pleasure of doing this. And it was really the second big railroad image uh, commission that I had. Well, as I got more architectural work and more railroad art, I started to study railroad art. And I looked in a different in, in various realms to get to get to learn about the history of, of this genre. So here is an 1865 uh, Jasper Francis Cropsey painting called Storica Viaduct, Pennsylvania. And Cropsey was one of the Hudson River artists, Hudson River School of Art, and it wasn't really a school, but it was a style in the mid 19th century. Uh, some of those artists feared the railroad as the machine is in the garden, it's going to tear up our, our natural world. Others like Cropsey painted the train as there and then gone, as fleeting as the smoke and steam, which is what we see there. Well, I began to look at these kind of paintings, not from a, an artistic, uh, stylistic fashion, but from a compositional statement. What was the artist really saying here? And what Cropsey is saying is that the train is not the nemesis of the land. And I thought, yeah, that's true. Trains and trolleys are not. They add something. And then we're back to that word again. What is that something? Well, this, uh, this idea of messages, ideas, came from other, other sources, not just historical art. I began to see something that was totally new, and I go back here to this. Some of you may know the name Aldo Leopold. He was an early environmentalist, 1930s, and he's known for a number of famous quotes, so this being one of, if not the most famous, he's talking about flora and fauna now. He's not talking about urban transportation or cities. He's talking about the natural world. But he said a thing or a project is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. And I got to thinking, oh my goodness, that's what railroads are. And that's why they work they inherently tend toward the preservation of integrity or connectedness. And that goes back to my Pittsburgh experiences. And they inherently tend toward stability in a region. They provide economic stability, social stability, and they provide a certain beauty. Not only are the trains and trolleys themselves reflective of, of serious design, but because they move through cityscapes and landscapes, they introduce the riders to the beauty of the surrounding uh, setting. So integrity, stability, and beauty. And that, folks, is what I con concluded is the elusive something that makes trains and trolleys so special. And that's why we are drawn to them. They do more than just move our stuff, but they connect us. They say something about the stability of our communities, our cities, small towns, our nation. They speak to beauty, which is lasting. And in a world such as ours, where integrity, stability, and beauty are trashed so often, there is indeed a role for something like trains and trolleys. So this, it was be really becoming the essence of my uh, uh, of my career. So what we're going to do here is take uh, maybe five historical paintings and look at this. And I'm going to show you how this worked historically. Now, the Japser, Jasper Cropsey painting that I showed you was considered fine art. That was gallery kind of thing. What I'm going to show you here is railroad commercial art, advertising art, because I asked the question, okay, is this something that makes the Cropsey painting so special, uh, is, is that something that shows up in advertising art? I conclude, yes, indeed it does. Those messages are very strong, and we're going to look at a couple of them here. Then we'll get into my art. So this is a post-World War II ad for the Milwaukee Roads Olympian Hiawatha. Well, we're not told where this is in the, in, in the American West, but we catch a sense of integrity, stability, and beauty 
Integrity, speaking of connectedness, we don't know where those trains are coming from or going, but we sure as heck know that they are connecting people and places. And there's also this connection with this, this uh, dude here on the horse. He has his, his cowboy hat off and he's waving at the, at the fireman, the engineman in the, uh, uh, in the locomotive cab. Uh, question, how many people wave at buses? And, and how many wave at, at, uh, at, at airplanes? Not too many, but it's part of the, of, of the connectedness that makes the railroad and even the streetcar a, uh, a part of the, the, the tying together of the fabric. Well, then what about stability and beauty? Well, in, if, if these trains are connecting places, there's an economic and social stability implied and also the beauty. Brooks Stevens was the industrial designer of these trains. And uh, some of you may know the name Otto Kuhler or Henry Dreyfus, uh, Raymond Lowy. All these were great industrial designers and they brought their skills to say something about this mode of transportation and how it draws us. So here's another piece. This is an older piece. This is a, a early 20th century, you know, early, early 20, early to late 1920s uh, for the North Coast Limited of the Northern Pacific. But catch this quote from Winston Churchill. Now, Churchill's always good for some kind of a quote, right? When I read this, it jumped off the page. We shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. Well, similarly, we shape our transportation systems and thereafter they shape us. And we can certainly see that in a negative way when we talk about some of the excesses of the auto age, but go before that and look at some of the positive things where we shape our transportation systems and they shape us. So here we shaped the Northern Pacific Railroad. It was one of those great transcontinentals that opened the nation. We shaped it and it shaped us. How? Because it enabled us to connect with the land and its people and to see them in a new kind of way. So look at the copywriter here. He says, or she wrote, Companion of Mountains, the North Coast Limited. Who would ever think today to say that a train is a companion of the landscape? They understood it then. We've lost something. So moving right ahead, maybe. No, nope. got too far here. Come on. Well, bear with me. There we are. This is a great northern piece, a booklet transportation or a tourist booklet called The Call of the Mountains for Glacier National Park, Montana. We don't even see a train in this. It's not even mentioned. It doesn't have to be. That was the only way you could get there. But just as I said, we shaped the trains and they shaped us. The trains shaped us the way in a way that we can see the mountains not just as a companion, as in the previous piece, but now here as something of value. Look at this. We have a Blackfeet Indian. He's standing there with his arms up and he's looking at the mountain. So we, as the viewer who picks up this booklet, oh, we want to go to Glacier Park. Oh, so we're invited to uh, stand there behind him and look out at the mountain. Yes, we are. And the railroad gets us there. It, we shaped it. It shapes us so we can see the mountain. But the kicker is this. It's not just that we can see the mountain. It's that we can see the mountain as he sees the mountain. You see, that Blackfeet brave sees the mountain as, as part of, as reflecting the divine thumbprint on the land of having value, of not to be trashed, but to be honored, to be used well, and indeed, as I use the word honor, and I'll go back to that, to be honored and to see the divine thumbprint on it. So that's the way we see the land is often affected by the way we travel to it or through it. So here's another similar kind of fascinating quote with a theme. James Howard Kunstler is a contemporary a pundit, and he has written this, a return to civility, and assuming, assuming that much of our culture is not civil, a return to civility is not possible unless we restore the bricks and mortar context of civility. 
That means we have to build the shapes that are civil. And to me, that means restoring the dynamic context of civility, the passenger train or the trolley. And here's a piece of artwork, again, North Coast Limited North Co or Northern Pacific Railway. And it is showing us this because you see what we have, this, this assuming a brother and sister, and he's pointing something about the landscape up through the, the Vista Dome to her. But the people across the aisle are looking at the kids. It's not, you see, just looking at the landscape. And it isn't just the train. Those are secondary elements to this composition. What's happening is a human dynamic. That is civility at work. It's civility pictured, and the railway enables that to happen. Okay. And the last one of these, Tony Judd, the late Tony Judd, wrote this. He's a, he was a New York-based writer. Railroads were and remain the necessary accompaniment to the emergence of a civil society. If we throw away the stations and the lines leading to them, as we did in the 50s and 60s, we'll be throwing away our memory of how to live the confident civic life. Is that not profound? And, and look at this ad from the Santa Fe, early 1960s, about a dome car. This is a piece of railroad technology. It's steel and glass and other kinds of hardware. It can't write, it can't read, it doesn't have a degree, it never went to school. But after books, it's one of the best teachers of American history. Again, there was a value in our culture that appreciated what the train did. It opened up learning. Who ever thought to consider the train as a vehicle of teaching and our part as a learner uh, when we are the passengers. But yet that's exactly what the Santa Fe was doing. And Tony Jutt brings that forward to say, if we throw this away, we will not know how to live the confident civic life. So we put all this together. If we understood how much trains could bring integrity, stability, and beauty to the common good, we would not call them just nostalgic. We call them essential. And all of this art that I've shown you makes that possible, or right? it reflects that, that. And so this is the theme that has guided my work for all these years and is behind the, uh, the, the book. So at some point, these themes come together and the light goes on for people. And they begin to ask the question, okay, the, the real question is not what are these paintings of? We know what they're of. It's what are they about? We understand it in a new way. So I want to tell you a story. This painting, which was the precursor to the cover painting for the book, it shows Glacier Park Lodge at East Glacier, Montana. Glacier Park Station, Amtrak's eastbound Empire Builder slowing for a stop there. Uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, I was asked to give a program at the lodge as part of a tour for uh, a bus and train tour for people to go into Montana and eventually down to Yellowstone. So we started at the lodge here with an opening program and, in which I shared many of the themes that I've shared with you so far. People understood that and as, as we were I was going through this presentation, I noticed a couple halfway back in the in the room who were nodding, they seemed to be tracking what I was saying and 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 it seemed to be getting it. Well, shortly after that, somebody in the back row put his hand up and with a kind of a quirky grin on his face said, Hey Craig, uh, do foamers believe what you're saying here? And I burst out laughing. I don't know how many of you know the term foamer. It's uh, generally used in a derogatory fashion, it refers to rail fans who have cameras around their neck and they foam at the mouth just waiting for the next train so they can get a picture of it. Well, I, I explained this to the, the guests, everybody laughed and, and I said, well, back to your question, sir. Yes, 
uh, at their best, foamers do get these things. They do understand how these, these themes overlap and how they connect and how they move us forward. So we finished up the lecture, got on some uh, buses and went down to another uh, uh, rail connection at Paradise, Montana and got on our charter train. Uh, about an hour into the train ride, we were going along uh, one of the, the Montana rivers there and it was this stellar day. The, uh, the sun was brilliant, uh, reflecting off the water. The, the fields glowed in the August sunshine. The, the mountains were blue against a, an azure sky. It was just, just grand. And here we were in a restored dome car, looking out at all this. And in front of us were all the posters that, that were a part of my presentation. So we had those scattered about on tables. So we looked from the tables to the train car to the landscape back to the posters, to the train car, to the landscape. And we just had this rhythmic kind of thing as we were rolling along. Suddenly the lady whom I referred to earlier, uh, who, who, she was standing next to me. She put her hand on my shoulder and had this kind of quirky grin and, and a twinkle in her eye. And she said, Craig, I think I'm becoming a foamer. At which point everybody just uh, dissolved into laughter. Uh, and she wasn't looking for the next opportunity to stand by the track and take a train picture. No, far from it. She was understanding how all these things fit together. It was a light going on experience for her. So as we shift now into these other paintings that I'm going to, to share with you, the question is not what are these paintings of, but they're, they're trains, they're buildings, they're people, but what are they about? Well, they are about all these bigger themes that I've been mentioning. And this one, there, there may be one or two train pictures, then we'll get into the trolleys. This is uh, the Capital Limited. It was a private commission by uh, an acquaintance of mine for his father. The father is painted in this picture as this little boy standing on the platform, a toe-head kid with the light blue shirt and the khaki pants. That was 1938, Silver Spring, Maryland. This kiddo was so enamored with trains. And his when he grew up, his, his dad commissioned this painting as a gift to him for his 85th birthday. When he gave it to him, he cried because it brought back so much of his life uh, uh, riding these trains, but also uh, as part of his, his avocation and in uh, the various places he lived. So we, we, we took trains for granted. And, and I wanna read uh, just one little slip, a snippet here from the book in follow-up to this painting. Uh, it says, taken for granted for decades, passenger trains like a Capital Limited stirred the imagination of trackside viewers who glanced up long enough to connect with these striking conveyances. So essential were these trains to a sense of place that earlier in the 20th century, a noted judge in Baden, Mississippi along the Illinois Central recessed his court for five minutes every session for 12 years. So everyone had time to watch the Panama Limited roar through town. Beauty, mobility, and a sense of place made these experiences of community so irregular and so unassumingly normal. So that just is an example of how the text supports these paintings and these images. So as, as I move here, trying to get my mouse to cooperate, Come on, here we go, uh, into to look at some electric railway equipment. So what I'm showing you now are paintings that I've done and all the philosophy that I've laid out for you as reflected in uh, the, the texts and in the, the historic paintings now comes, comes round and, and, and shows again in these kind of paintings that are part of uh, major parts of, of my, my uh, artistic career. This is one of a series of 50 paintings done to reflect historic railway events in each of the 50 states. One painting per state. This was done 
uh, oh, about uh, 20 years ago for the Unicover Corporation in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And they released these as prints and other kinds of collectibles. So here we have the very first electric locomotive, 1895 mainline locomotive in the United States uh, in the uh, Howard Street Tunnel in Baltimore. And then coming forward and coming west, this is the Great Northern's uh, main line across the Washington Cascades uh, at scenic Washington. And in, in the view here is one of the large W-class locomotives. Great Northern had all kinds of electrics, the two big GE W-class locomotives. What we don't know is the role that these played in opening up the West, even in and this painting was in the 50s, but in the 1920s when this 1929 is when this, this the new tunnel under the mountain in the background was put through, uh, the railroad uh, factored into this in a very major way. We don't know these things in our country, but did you know that the opening of the Cascade Tunnel, the eight mile Cascade Tunnel was uh, celebrated on radio for the very first time a multiple sourced radio program was uh, broadcast by NBC. And there were affiliates in uh, Washington, D.C., I uh, believe Philadelphia, uh, New York, uh, this site in, in Washington and in San Francisco. And there, there were programs of speeches and entertainment and all to celebrate the opening of the Cascade Tunnel. It was that important to the country that pioneering radio took a whole hour and did this kind of an immense link, link up. Nobody had ever done anything like that before. This is just an example of, of the railroad in American life, just as the title of the book says. So here we go to uh, an interurban car. Uh, this, this being a Chicago Aurora and Elgin. Uh, many of you know the importance of interurbans in our railroad and industrial railroad history. Uh, and here, the, happily, these cars, these two cars have been saved. Uh, the 460 in the foreground is at the Illinois Rail Museum. Uh, th this particular painting was not done for a client. This one was, for, or for a commercial client. This was done for a, uh, a private client. And we see here, him, uh, Bob, uh, Alkire is his name. Here we see him as a seven-year-old getting ready to board the train with his mom to go into Chicago. So the horizon line of the painting is low. It's at, at the eye level of a seven-year-old, not of a grown-up. Another piece commissioned by Bob uh, is this Illinois Terminal Streamliner north of St. Louis. And uh, some of you may be a part of the uh, Center for Railway Photography and Art. And one of the recent magazines, they did a fascinating story about the railroad vanishing point and the, the, the railroad perspective. And of all of my paintings, this one has so much going on. Uh, and it, it's, it's a thrilling painting for me. It was as a commission because I happened to like what those trains stood for. But the composition is thrilling to me because it, it, it leads us back into it. And we see a lot of things happening. But behind this is, an, is a sort of more subtle thing. The interurban as a, as a transport concept in American transportation history kind of cut across the expected uh, railroads of its day. And that's literally what's happening here. It's the Illinois Central and the, uh, that goes back to the center rear. And I think this nickel plate on the right. Uh, the, and so there's a symbolism here of the idea of the interurban and what it did as a connecting technology uh, cut across some of the typical and expected ways that railroads did things. And it provided a new level of service, a new level of comfort, a new level of connectivity. So let's see here, what's next? Then we come to PCC cars. This is a, a, again, a private commission and it shows a PCC in Kansas City. But I wanna spend a few minutes here at the Pennsylvania Trauma Museum. So this piece was commissioned by Scott Becker and the museum as fundraiser for the capital campaign. We see here the 1711 and the 16 
13 in the background, both of which now operate right at this spot. This is county home uh, siding where the old county home was off to the left. And we see here the, uh, the waiting shelter and a Pennsylvania Railroad uh, uh, commuter train between Washington and, and Pittsburgh uh, behind on, on, the, on the single track uh, Pensy line. Uh, the the uh, county home uh, waiting shelter is being rebuilt. Uh, long long ago torn down, uh, but it will be rebuilt so people can stand there and get a sense of what this was like uh, to come to visit people at the home and also to be a part of a whole interurban network. So I wanted to show you here just a couple of examples of how a painting develops. So it, in this case, uh, working from photographs, I started with this high horizon line piece with the horizon line being above the two streetcars and above the, the steam locomotive. I played with different versions of that and then I decided, no, nope, we're going to put the horizon line lower at six feet right at the, at the view, the uh, eye level of uh, these adults standing there. And what that did is it pushed, the, made the, the 1711 higher. And, and, and uh, it, it made the, the painting more accessible, more inviting. And of course, the, 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 you can just compare the two. The, the, the 1711 has more prominence and more presence here than it does in the, uh, the image off to the left. So the final poster is what we see here. And we have, I think Larry Lovejoy uh, suggested to Scott that we, we use the Pittsburgh Railways logo there and the trolley. PA Trolley Museum logo here. So that's the final piece as it was printed in uh, offset uh, copies. So there are two uh, illustrations in the book that look forward to what railroading and trolleys can be. These are used, were used and are used by the museum to show the, the, uh, the, the new campus. So what we have here is the the building that is uh, being finished, and as Kristen said earlier, should be done in uh, early uh, fall. Here we have uh, the same building with the roof off, so we're looking down inside. So what you see here are examples of my work that takes the viewer into a different way of looking at a railroad scene. These styles I borrowed from my architectural illustration years, and th these are watercolor and ink. The previous, virtually all the other illustrations were done in, uh, in, in oil. So we see here uh, a different kind of style that is, is used. Now today, you know, this isn't very popular. A lot of people don't go for the uh, original hand-drawn art and they seem to prefer a computer-generated piece. But the computer-generated arts so often lacks life and uh, the current, the the, the response that I hear is that this kind of presentation draws you into it. So here's another one. Uh, this is of uh, what was at this time known as Trolley Street. Now it's Volunteer Boulevard. The new visitor center will be to our right. And off to the left is the uh, Barry Stout Park, the playground for kids with a gazebo back there. And then the uh, uh, trolley display building. On the wall is an enlargement of a uh, postcard that reflects the, one of the trolley lines at Newcastle, Pennsylvania, way back in the, in the 20s. And it sort of flows into this park-like atmosphere. And moving ahead, another, another piece showing the, uh, the Wexford trolley station off to the right, another view of Volunteer Boulevard with a two-car train of uh, Philadelphia Suburban transportation in our urbans. Behind it, of course, is the uh, trolley display or the new uh, visitor center and get your popcorn while it lasts. I've done a black and white, number of black and whites for the museum and this one at the fairground stop. This was done to show what the, the new uh, uh, canopy would look like done uh, with those are from the old Pittsburgh and Lake Erie railway station in downtown Pittsburgh. Uh, the uh, streetcar, the inner urban on the right is a Monongahan West Penn, the 250, which at some point will be restored and run on the lines. 
Uh, this is for the seashore, or I'm sorry, Shoreline Trolley Museum in Connecticut, and it's the interior of one of their car barns. The, uh, the staff there requested the painting or the, you know, the rendering to show people what this would look like. And once again, uh, they felt, and I agree, that original art tells the story in an evocative and inviting way. So we're invited to stand here be, behind these visitors and enjoy this as, as it goes in. So I mentioned uh, this painting earlier of the X2000. All these paintings uh, have their place and their style and, uh, and their unique story. And I told you the story of the, the uh, first rendering that I did being swiped from Transportation Research Institute. Well, here, uh, as I was starting in on this painting, I got a call from Amtrak one day and they said, could you take your black and white sketch, put some color on it and send it to us so we can display it on the train? let people know what the final painting will look like. And I said, sure. So I did that, sent it off. Two weeks later, I got a panicked phone call. Help, the painting was stolen. Do you have a copy? Yes, I have a copy. So I sent the, sent the color photocopy back to uh, DC. They put it on the X2000. Two weeks later, I got another phone call. The copy was stolen. Now, some can look at this and say these are recalcitrant rail fans who are, have a, are morally challenged and just uh, want to walk away with a souvenir. Maybe so. But other people have looked at that, uh, these stories and said, no, there's something deeper going on. We have a hopeless culture in many, many ways. And these are paintings and drawings that suggest hope. And people want it. They want hope in whatever way they can get it. These guys, whoever stole, stole these, these sketches, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be going through a mental uh, exercise of saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm uh, living in a hopeless society. I need, a, I need a picture of hope. Nobody's suggesting that for a moment. But the point is that there's this internal response to hope when we see it. And it's this kind of imagery that links the railroad ethos, the streetcar ethos, mobility ethos with the hope of renewed cities, of renewed connections, of renewed stability and integrity. And so here are just some examples of this kind of technique that is used. In the upper left piece, Shenandoah Rail Corridor in Virginia. Uh, the one on the right is a Washington state uh, uh, suggestion of a fruit being loaded onto uh, uh, refrigerator cars on the back end of a passenger train. Uh, it's interesting that the go back to the upper left one, the Shenandoah one, for just a moment. When uh, this was unveiled in Virginia, uh, I was not there, but a colleague was. He said the uh, the Norfolk Southern representative who was representing the railroad that owns this right away, he 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 reacted in a very uh, telling way, and it was this. Uh, this, this exists now just as a single track. Uh, and the uh, Virginia Rail Solutions is proposing electrifying the whole thing and, and, and adding two more tracks. So the Norfolk Southern fellow was there. He was kind of uh, harumphing about the fact that, that uh, uh, this was being shown without his permission. But when he, he reacted to the passenger train and he said, if this keeps up, meaning if the passenger train keeps up, this kind of uh, the inclusion of passenger trains on this kind of a right of way, if this keeps up, it will mean nothing less than the passengerization of the industry. Duh. Yes, that is the whole point. He understood that rendering instantly. He didn't have to think about it. And he reacted to it, just like those people who walked off with the with the renderings. There's a visceral response. And that's what, what happened here. Now, this hasn't been built yet, but boy, there sure is a lot of talk about. It. Okay, so we we'll come down to the last few images. This is a scene at Grand Canyon. And no, there are not trains at this particular spot 
where you see the steam train in the background, there are trains. Now, perhaps some of you have had the good fortune to ride <clears throat> the Grand Canyon Railway. Uh, back in 1996, the National Park Service put out a request for a proposal for public transportation options around the South Rim Historic Area. And this is the center of the South Rim Historic Area. The, the main, main buildings being the Santa Fe Railway Station and the El Tavar Hotel. Well, Grand Canyon Railway suggested, uh, pulled together a group of people to suggest an, a, a concept. And I was part of that team, very fortunate enough to be a part of that. Uh, historian Al Runty was the sort of the key lead on it. And, and I came along to, to work. As a, as a team, we put together this system uh, to suggest uh, a light rail concept. This could have been electrified. Uh, it could have been uh, fuel cell, could have been battery powered. What we see here, uh, I'm assuming, because we didn't show overhead wires, we wanted to keep this as clean, as simple as possible. But this was one of the European train sets that came to America in the, in the 90s. And the painting was one of a series of five or six uh, published in a rather elaborate brochure, pardon me, <coughs> that, uh, that explained how a rail system would connect these parts of the Grand Canyon historic area and would bring um, not just connectivity, but uh, uh, a, uh, a respect to the land. It, it did not happen because of the political changes uh, in, in the administration between Clinton and Bush. But at the time, those months when, when, when Bruce Babbitt was the Secretary of the Interior, this had a presence. People responded to it and they, they saw real possibilities for it. And I'm, I'm coming down to the end of these slides now with, with this one, and I wanna make this point. Of all the forward-looking art, that I have shown you. And again, in this show, most of that is uh, electrified streetcars, light rail and heavy rail. Uh, most of that electrification uh, is, is, a, is tied up in this. And these kind of forward looking illustrations continued to get more response than any other set of illustrations that I have ever done across the course of the 30 years of my career. And that tells me something, perhaps many things. One is that people respond to the Grand Canyon as a national icon. They want it preserved. They see what it means in, in terms of the, the millennia of, of, of geological history, uh, but also of a uh, historical place of, of meaning to our country. And the fact that these trains are a part of it, uh, are recognized by so many people as a tool to help that preservation and to move us forward. So I, I want to underscore this for you, this, this idea of moving forward with our rail transportation, whether it's the trolley museum or something else, uh, the idea of transcending the, the past, but also incorporating the past as we move forward. So here we have rail diesel cars, or in this case, battery powered cars that respect the land, that honor, and, and it bring us right back again to the integrity, stability, and beauty of Aldo Leopold. And I wanna go back one more picture here. The last two images are contemporary. Uh, this was Amtrak's 50th anniversary painting commissioned uh, a couple of years ago. And it, it, when, when they came to me, they said, we want you to speak to connections. Uh, we want to show trains, but we want to show people in the foreground. So this is the piece as it was, is finished. And it shows connections between Naperville, Illinois, it's Naperville Station on the right and Chicago in the distance. Now, uh, 
I know that you don't see the uh, the, the uh, Sears Tower or the Willis Tower from Naperville. Can't do that. But you see, I have a telephoto brush, so I put that back in there. Uh, so there's a connection between small town and metropolitan area, small city, large city. Their connections with the trains. We have an older train on the right, Horizon Cars. We have uh, on the uh, in the central part of the painting the new Siemens locomotives and uh, Superliner cars. That's Southwest Chief. We have connections between races. We have black folks. We have Asian people. We have Caucasians. There are other people of different mixed races. We have ages. We have this little boy and his father. Uh, we have connections between crew and passengers. This guy is waving to the fellow in the cab. Uh, and that interaction was suggested by an Amtrak employee here in Seattle. So, so this it sums it up. It's called Making Connections. And the text, if you were to read it, underscores how Amtrak views its role in bringing this, these multiple levels of connections to people all around the country. And the last, well, oh, Kristen, I don't know how I got, I missed the last painting. Oh, uh, you can uh, share your screen again if you like. Okay, let's try that. Let's, yeah, okay. So we'll have a go here. Uh, thank you for walking me through this again. And yeah, you'll just have to scroll down to the, Oh, uh, can I do that or play from start? Uh, you'll have to go through all of them again if you play. Yeah, that's start. okay. I'll just, I'll just, okay. So we'll just, okay. Uh, you all can fill in the commentary for each one of these, huh? As we go through it. Uh, quick review. Yeah, I like the review actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay, come on. So we're down to, oh, I missed that. I'll tell you about that one. These are two for, two for Chicago. This is the one on the left is new. It, that, that, that shows the, uh, uh, the new international terminal and the idea of a high-speed rail line below it. And okay, so here's the, here's the final slide. Uh, this is one that, that was not commissioned. I did it myself uh, for myself. It's called Will the Fog Ever Lift? And it shows Amtrak's Empire Builder along the uh, upper reaches of the Mississippi River, southbound towards Chicago on a foggy day. So the title of the painting, Will the Fog Ever Lift, refers to, first of all, yes, the literal fog, will it ever lift along the river so people can get a view across uh, that, that, that gorgeous panorama across the Mississippi River? Will that ever happen? But the deeper meaning is will the fog of our culture ever lift so these things that i've been sharing with you today the things that i've been painting these these themes these images will the fog ever lift so those are seen for what they really mean and can be will the fog ever lift so that our country can re-engage transportation in a way that brings integrity, stability, and beauty to our country. And with it, a, uh, a health and a vitality that is, is so uh, precarious in given the incivilities that we uh, experience. So it's at that deeper level, that's the deeper meaning behind the title. So I conclude, before I actually do read a, a one last paragraph. I want to come and mention to you, folks, and your relationship the, regarding your relationship with the Pennsylvania Trauma Museum. Because, see, what you are doing with that museum is you are helping that fog to lift. The literal, no, the figurative, yes. This figurative fog in our culture. What you are doing at Pennsylvania Trauma Museum is you're telling a historical story. You're, you're telling people what it was like, and you're saying, this is what it meant. And by implication, you are saying, this is what it means. So I, I want to encourage you and upbuild you as a museum with a mission. 
And I want to encourage you to, to take that sweep of history, this arc of history, and extend it for your visitors to what can be. Let them see, let them hear from you just how important this mode is and, and what it can do, uh, just as long distance trains, commuter trains, freight trains, all these other expressions of the railroad motif and add to that the, the, the trolley, the light rail, the electrified railroad. Tell that story and invite people into it and help them shape it as well. So I conclude now with this one paragraph from the epilogue. In closing, this memoir is ultimately about the power of beauty and art. To be immersed in the medium for 30 years is to be shaped by it. It is to see beauty and to enable beauty when one doesn't expect it. Beyond illuminating technical options, these drawings and paintings help people recognize the deeper values inherent in railroading ones that contribute more to a civil society and the common good than mobility alone. This is the allusive work of art. I did not know that word until a few years ago. Allusive means to point well beyond itself. So I'm saying this is the allusive work of art to point well beyond what meets the eye with the tangible becoming an icon of the intangible and the temporal and icon of the lasting. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Craig. That was wonderful. Um, we are gonna, uh, I actually have some questions of my own. Uh, I'm going to let folks unmute themselves in just a minute. Um, but before everybody skedaddles, I did wanna let everybody know, um, we do have a couple other things coming up here at the museum. Uh, we've got a trolleyology July 25th, where the heck is Hecla by <laughs> one of our volunteers, Dennis Kramer. And of course, the Washington County Agricultural Fair is coming up August 12th to 19th. So if you ever want to see seven streetcars run at once uh, at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, now's your chance because on the busy days of the fair, we do run a lot of streetcars. We're like a little miniature transit system that week. Last year, we transported over 8,000 passengers. So it's a very exciting week for the museum. Uh, and participate in the age-old tradition of taking the trolley to the fair. Uh, and then August 29th, we'll have one about Frank Sprague from Tom Lawrenson, who is a volunteer at Shoreline Trolley Museum. And uh, Craig, what you were saying about lifting the fog here, uh, you know, people at the museum uh, helping to, to lift that fog, I think that applies to all of our viewers who are um, in some way supporting railway preservation, whether it's at PTM, or um, I, I know we have folks here from railway organizations, clubs, and museums all over the country. That's right. Absolutely. Everybody has that role to play. Yep. Uh, so thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, if you would like to make a donation or become a member or a volunteer, you can do that at patrolley.org slash support, which I did put in the chat just a few minutes ago, so you can easily click on that. Um, and then thank you again to those of you who donated. And thank you very much to Craig. Um, so I do want to get into a couple of my personal questions. So um, I would love to know uh, exactly like more process kind of related. Like I know there must be an incredible amount of research that goes into a painting before you ever even start. You know, um, I'm recognizing like the signals and semaphores on particular lines and those, you know, are very geographical and yeah, like, do you have photo references? Uh, like, even the clothing that people are wearing. Like, how do you know that's period appropriate? Like, tell us, <laughs> what, tell us more about what goes into this. <laughs> well, yeah, that that's a great question, Kristen. Yes, and it does take a lot of research. Uh, happily, I get to work with historians and, and and museum people, professional railroaders, and so together with their uh, combined collection of just treasure trove of imagery. Uh, I, we have the, the, the wonders of the internet. So, you know, I can always Google this or Google that and, and, and find, uh, find images that, that help me. Uh, I get into something, uh, generally as, as a project starts, people have an idea. So then that leads to some, a contract, yes, but then it leads to some initial sketches. And then, then, then I start incorporating 
the the material that that comes my way and I'll, i don't hesitate to make changes as necessary but that that's often that that often happens that way uh, so then then when we all agree on the content and again these are just black and white pencil sketches then then i'll transfer that to a canvas or another medium if we're doing ink and watercolor and, and then i'll use the use the color but yeah it, it all those little elements uh, are a part of it and forgive me for chattering i just have to tell you this one little story about research i did a drawing for the issaquah uh, valley trolley project here in issaquah few years ago was the painting of the train station in 1920 and so it had all the historic stuff so I researched all these uh, elements for the painting you know the the trains the switches the the buildings the historic buildings all this and when the painting was uh, oh and including a milk wagon and a kid at the milk wagon so when the painting was delivered to the client uh, she she loved it and she in turn showed it to a, one of her colleagues and the, the lady looked at it and she said oh wait a minute what year was this supposed to be? And the, the lady said, 1921, why? And, and the, the, the other visitor said, oh, it couldn't possibly be 1921. That's a golden retriever in there. And they were not bred in Washington until 1929. <laughs> wow. I, okay. I, I got my comeuppance. Whoever thought I'd have to research a dog? Yeah, you learn something uh, new every day, I guess. <laughs> now, uh, another question I had, do you ever you know you get a commission or you know maybe something that's a little more of a vague concept like we're looking for this do you ever get like painter's block uh no not really uh my enthusiasms go up and down depending on how tired i get but, <laughs> no i i find a stimulation in all of these commissions each one has a life of its own and a story that it needs to be told and so to to my role as an artist is to serve the art i'm not to dominate the art i'm to serve it i'm in, I, my here my role is to bring it into being and then let it speak so i don't keep these paintings they go out they, you know, i don't want them here i'm happy to have the copies but let's get the paintings out there where they really work so absolutely um a couple comments in the chat uh Jerome Joseph says, thanks so much for illuminating an important aspect of our shared passion, Craig. Foam on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, lots you. of other nice comments coming in as well. Uh, a question from Mike. Does every work of yours have a pencil drawing on the canvas or paper underneath the paint and watercolor? Yes, that's all right. <clears throat> yep. uh, definitely with all the oils. That's I'll start that. And then with the ink and watercolors, I'll do a pencil drawing. And uh, on, on architectural tracing paper. And then I'll put a heavier architectural tracing film on top, a, a mylar kind of thing. And then I will, I will trace that pencil drawing with ink and I'll add more details. And then that gets photographed, or sorry, gets photocopied onto watercolor paper. And then I put watercolor on it. Lots of other nice comments coming in. Let me see if I missed any questions here. Thank you, Craig, for the most eloquent and compelling rail art slash history presentation I have ever seen and heard. Well, thank you, Peter Hollinshead. <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, so I have allowed everyone to unmute themselves. So if you do have a question or a comment, uh, <laughs> another comment that came in, the show was better than excellent. <laughs> Thanks. I can. I'm. I'm glad to be here and share it. And yeah. Edward, I see you have yourself unmuted. Yes, Christian. Right. I just want to, as always, I want to thank you for organizing this. And while it wasn't your traditional trolleyology type subject, it was wonderful. Thank and you. I was present last April in uh, Washington when Craig uh, spoke to us. In fact, I spoke to him because. Uh, I had run into some of the people involved with the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum calendars, yes. and he does wonderful job, Craig. Wonderful job. And Thank you very much. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. In fact, the guy who said, you know what? I'm not going to leave it at that. The guy who said foam on, I'm going to pile on and say foam on, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, Kristen, I think we've, we've come up with a new term here. 
you know, yeah. we can encourage one another. Yeah, we'll put on a t-shirt. That's one line. That's right. <laughs> well, my first, little mind is already doing weird things with I that. I first heard the term in the UK when I was in the UK and they pointed out, you know, someone pointed out at the end of the platform, this was in the late 70s, pointed out to the end of the platform, oh, look, there's all the farmers taking down the engine numbers. <laughs> and if anybody else? Anybody else? All right. I don't see anybody unmuting themselves. So I think okay. we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank have you the best again. night of your life. <laughs> thank you so very much, Craig. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you to those of you who donated. I hope you can come see us sometime soon at the museum. If not this year, definitely next year when we've got, well, or later this year when we've got our brand new building open. Um, I look forward to giving you all updates as we uh See you at the next trolleyology. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you, Kristen. And again, uh, this will be on YouTube within the next couple weeks. Have a great evening, everybody, and a great rest of your week. Bye, Bye. Thank you, Greg. Keep Bye -bye. on painting. Bye. Thank you. Watch out.